Hello everyone, welcome to this session. My name is Yvonne Lumbasio. The unit code is DHT 2118, Culture and Heritage Tourism. I'm from the Department of Travel and Tourism Management, School of Hospitality, Travel and Tourism. So I'll start by defining what culture is and according to UNESCO, culture is a set of distinctive spiritual, material, intellectual and emotional features of a society which are usually in form of literature, art, the art of living together, value systems, traditions and beliefs. Uh, it can also be defined as the characteristics and knowledge of a particular group of people or society which includes their language, religion, cuisines, social habits, music and arts. So basically culture is what different people do and their way of lifestyles and living. Uh, next we'll be defining cultural tourism. Uh, cultural tourism is the movement of persons to cultural attractions away from their places of residence with the intentions to gather new information and experiences. Uh, it usually involves different festivals, rituals, art and craft, celebrations and different events. So what we are saying is cultural tourism is the act of a person moving from one place to a cultural site in order to experience the different cultural practices that take place there. Our heritage tourism, it involves visiting historical or industrial sites such as old buildings, old means of transport with the aim of appreciating the past. And a good example of heritage tourism is when visitors decide to visit Fort Jesus in Mombasa or Jumbalamtwana, Rabai, etc. Uh, next, we look at the characteristics of culture, and the first characteristic is culture is shared. Uh, culture is shared in the sense that the roles, some of the roles that are practiced by the men, uh, they are also practiced by the women. And what we mean by sharing is across all the communities that we have in Kenya. Some of the roles that are practiced by the men are practiced all over the communities. For example, in all the communities, the head of the family is usually the man, and it is always the work of the women to take care of the house and take care of the kids. Next is culture is learned and not biologically inherited. Uh, what we're saying is the process where culture is passed from one generation to the next one is known as enculturation. This is where the children begin learning their culture immediately when they are born. In the sense that when a child is born, they need to go through the naming ceremony, the birth rituals and all that. So at this stage, they are already passing through some cultural practices. And the process where one's culture, one decides to do away with their culture is usually known as acculturation. This is when somebody decides they don't want to do what is done in their cultural background or they don't want to embrace what their great grandparents used to do. Number three, culture is based on symbols which include signs, sounds, and other things that represent meaningful concepts in a society. Most important aspect in each community is their language. Now, the language is very unique in each community because in Kenya we have 42 tribes. All these 42 tribes speak their specific and unique language. So on, the Luyas can only communicate with the Luyas, the Masais can only communicate with the Masais, the Kalenjins can only communicate with the Kalenjins. The Kalenjins cannot communicate with the Luyas and they understand each other. So we are saying it's based on simple signs, sounds, and, and any other thing. Next is culture is dy dynamic. When one element within the cultural system shifts, the entire system will automatically change. And a good example of this is the rural urban migration, where people decide to move from their rural area to urban area and embrace what is done in the cities and do away with their cultural background. 
Next is culture is integrated. The foundation of culture usually includes structural elements meant to work together to ensure that any culture is sustained. These elements include sociocultural structures which determine how different people will interact with each other, cultural infrastructures meant to provide basic necessities of life so as to be able to sustain different livelihoods, e.g. the houses, cultural superstructures meant to provide a belief system that helps people to identify themselves with the society together with those around them. So these three elements, social cultural structures, cultural structures and cultural superstructures, they cannot, one cannot work with the, without the two. So the three must be integrated in any cultural community for them to be effective. Next, we're looking at significance of culture. And the first one, it gives an individual a sense of belonging in the sense that when one has a cultural background, then they'll be able to conserve, preserve, and practice what is always done in their community. Number two, through cultural tourism, there is conservation and preservation of cultural practices by different communities, hence ensuring its sustainability to different destinations. Promotes unity among different people in the society through the cultural festivals. It is a tool for entertainment, especially the different cultural dances and songs. It creates job opportunities uh, especially these cultural centers, they need manpower to, to take, they need manpower to take up what culture is done in different communities. So with this you get that there is job, creation of job opportunities at these centers. It gives one a sense of identification because everyone will be proud to say that I'm from this culture and this is what we do. So it gives one that sense of identification. It helps to build and boost the image of different people through cultural interactions. And a good example of how culture helps to boost and build the image of people is through the cultural festivals that you usually have nationally. Like the Mugidi night, you find that so many people from different cultures usually attend these ceremonies, hence building and boosting the image of different people. It is a source of revenue to the government through the cultural tourism. Uh, this means that when cultural tourists visit different places for cultural tourism activities, they usually pay some fees to get access into these places. Now these fees that they pay, the government usually has some tax that is paid to them and as a result they are able to get their revenue through cultural tourism. Our culture educates different people through learning new cultural practices and culture research. Uh, we have those specific people that are usually interested in learning and knowing what different communities do according to their culture apart from where they come from. So when we get this kind of a tourist, it means that he or she is willing to learn and get to know new ideas and new things about what different communities do. We also have cultural research where people visit different communities to research about their cultural practices, their cultural beliefs and their ways of livelihood and why they, they still practice their culture or they don't still practice their culture. A good example of where we have cultural research taking place is among the Maasai people and the Samburu people who still embrace their culture to death. Uh, it is a source of revenue to the host communities through performing cultural dances to the tourists when they visit these places. They can also sell souvenirs to the cultural tourists and they can also offer tour guiding services to the cultural tourists and as a result they are able to sustain themselves. It helps in the development of infrastructure and superstructures at different cultural sites so as to accommodate the needs of different tourists. Now when a different cultural site is developing, definitely we'll need infrastructure that will lead the tourists to these places. Once the cultural tourists are at these places, they'll need superstructures in, ter in terms of hotels and accommodation facilities, which are usually meant to accommodate their needs. 
It helps in learning and appreciating new languages by different people who are always interested with a specific community. As I said before, it educates. So in the same way, you're able to learn new language apart from what you know from your community. It promotes intermarriages between different communities. Uh, different, communi different cultural backgrounds communities are able to intermarry. For example, a Luo can intermarry a Luya, and hence it promotes intermarriages. It strengthens the relationship between different cultural communities. Now, when a community still embraces their cultural practices, and another one still does the same, these two communities will have a good relationship and to some extent they'll have some similarities. A good example is the Maasai and the Samburu. What the Maasai speak is Ma and what the Samburu speak is Ma. So once they interact, they'll be able to understand each other, hence strengthen their relationship. Uh, we have challenges facing cultural and heritage tourism. The first one is westernization where people want to embrace what the first and second world countries do and not do what their cultural backgrounds are. And this is a very good example because in Kenya we have at least not less than five communities that still practice their cultural practices. The rest, westernization has taken place and they want to do what the first and second world countries do. In security, some of these cultural sites are not secure hence posing a challenge to the cultural tourists when they visit the sites. Language barrier between the host community and the tourists, especially if they don't have an interpreter to interpret what the community is saying to the tourists. We have hostility from the host communities to the tourists. You'll find that when some of the cultural tourists visit these destinations, some of the communities are always not hospitable and not friendly to them. So as a result of this, they'll not want to come back and experience what was not so good to them. We have commercialization of culture. Nowadays, people are interested in making money more than conserving their cultures. A good example is what we've said that when this cultural tourists visit different destinations, they're usually required to pay some fee. So this person will only be interested in the money and not delivering all the cultural practices to the tourists. Gender discrimination, uh, this is within different communities in terms of what the women can do and the men cannot do and vice versa. Solutions to the cultural practices. Uh, the first one is tourist police should be deployed at different cultural sites to ensure the security of the tourists at all times. Equal allocation of funds by the government towards the construction of infrastructures and superstructures and also involving different stakeholders and NGOs who will come and provide funds for these structures to develop. Creation of awareness to the host communities on the importance of conserving, preserving, and practicing their cultural background. Deployment of translators at different tourist sites so as to avoid communication breakdown. This will solve the problem of language barrier. When we have a translator between the tourists and the host community, then communication will be able to take place, hence avoiding the communication breakdown. Appreciating all genders of the society equally and allocation of equal roles. Communities should be hospitable and welcoming, and if need be, they can be taken through a training or a seminar on how to handle different guests and dealing with specific people and, the, and their needs. Uh, next, we look at museums in Kenya. These are institutions that care or conserves a collection of artifacts and other objects of artistic, cultural, historical, or scientific importance. They have existed in many centuries, and the main reason of their establishment was to house different artifacts which were used by different scholars, researchers, and not necessarily 
for public viewing and money making. However, with time, they developed into places where artifacts were protected and shown to different visitors. Formal museums in Kenya were established during the 17th century, and today we have several types of museums that exist, which include art and craft museums. They usually display different paintings, photographs, and artwork that is done by different people, either present or in the past. And examples of art and craft museums in Kenya, we have the Narok Museum in Narok County, Nairobi National Museum in Nairobi County, and Kitale Museum in Transzoia County. Next, we have the sports museums. They usually celebrate local sports figures or those that have excelled internationally in terms of sports. They house their photos, uniforms, sporting equipment, and anything else related to sports. Uh, examples of sports museums in Kenya, we have the Cabernet Museum and Tambaj Museum in El Geo Maracuet County. Next, we have musical museums. Uh, they are meant to house clothing, musical instruments, albums, and other related instruments that were used by famous musicians in the society. Examples of this, we have the Meru Museum in Meru County, Kisumu Museum in Kisumu County, Kitale in Trans Zoya County, and Karen Blixen Museum in Nairobi County. We have war museums are meant to celebrate the war heroes, and in most cases, they usually display their weapons, photographs, machineries, etc., that were used in a particular time. Example, we have the Kapenguria Six Museum, Nyeri Museum because of the Mau Mau fighters, Nairobi National Museum, Railway Museums in Nairobi County, and Kisumu Museum. And we also have industrial museums, which in most cases they're usually based in a functioning industrial center or city, and some have been renovated and being used in manufacturing different goods and products for consumption by different people. An example of industrial museums, we have the railway museums in Nairobi County and Kariandusi prehistorical sites in Nakuru County because of the floor spa that is being produced there. Uh, the next type of museum, we have the stamp, postcard, and coins museum. These are the most preferred museums by many people and many cultural tourists all over the world because they usually display a great deal about the historical development of a specific country, people, or society. Uh, they usually also display the history and development of a particular community in terms of their cultural practices since when their forefathers were there up to date, together with their cultural practices, what was being done in the past and what is being done today. And with Stamp, Postcard, and Coins Museum, uh, all museums in Kenya are examples of this because at least when you visit each museum in Kenya, there is some history and development about a different community or people and what they usually do. Next is signage museums. Uh, they reflect an interest in the heritage and technology in relation to the geographical features, climatic changes, and weather conditions. And a good example of signage museum is Railways Museum in Kenya and Ottawa Museum in Canada. Uh, with the Konza City that is in the Vision 2030, we expect to have a museum there, a very modern technological museum there, which will also fall under the example of the signage museums. And next we have sources of revenues for museums. For any museum to function effectively, they need some source of revenue, which is meant to maintain the museum and to pay their staffs. So the first place where they get their sources from is through government fundings. As you are, you are all aware, the, the government usually have a budget every year. So with this budget, the tourism docket is usually allocated some fund to help the industry and boost their practices. So this is where we get 
the funds for the museums from the budget that the government has allocated to the tourism industry. So through allocations of, of some funds to support the tourism industry in their budgets and also th through different parastatals. Now in the tourism industry we have different parastatals that usually provide funds to those upcoming touristic sites and also museums. Uh, some of these parastatals we have Kenya Tourism Trust Fund, the initials are KTTF, Kenya Tourism Fund, KTF, Kenya Tourism Development Authority, KTDA. Now for you to get funds from KTTF, KTF and KTDA, you need to do a proposal about what you are bringing on board and the benefits of your sites to the tourism industry. Once these boards are satisfied that what you are bringing on board is okay, they'll be able to give you the funds of which you'll pay within a stipulated period of time. So basically what you need is to do a proposal of your upcoming business and you're good to go. Next is through the tourists. Uh, when we have the cultural and heritage tourists visiting different touristic sites, they usually pay some fees that is stipulated at the gate. Now these fees that is paid after the government gets their tax, the remaining revenue is usually retained by the museums of Kenya, which is used to pay their staffs, maintain the museums. Next is donation from well-wishers who are usually passionate about the preservation of different museums. Now we have those cultural tourists who, are, who have a really great interest in museums. When they visit these museums, they usually come with donations that they give to the museums in form of cash. Now this cash is usually meant to support the activities in the museums. Uh, these donations can also come from the researchers, the international researchers who come to research about different museums that have housed different artifacts that were used in the past. Now when they come and do a research and they get that they have gotten a great impact of knowledge, they usually give some donations to the museum to help them in their functioning and upkeep. So most of the museums rely on donations and especially on the researchers who are interested in cultural and heritage research. Next, funding from non-governmental organizations who usually support different researchers who conduct research in museums. Now, we have different non-governmental organizations who give funds to the researchers to come and conduct research in these museums. And a good example of a non-governmental organization that gives funds is United Nations World Tourism Organization which provides funds to different tourism facilities all over the world for them to be able to sustain themselves and maintain themselves. Uh, this body, the United Nations World Tourism Organization, usually sends its researchers to different places in different countries to do a research in the museums, and they facilitate the researchers as well as giving the museums some support in terms of cash. Next, we have loans from banks and microfinance institutions, and the payment is usually after a specific period of time. Now, the museums can do a proposal uh, indicating why they need the money and the amount that they need, after which they'll take to different banks and microfinance organizations. If the banks and microfinance organizations are satisfied that the proposal is okay, then they usually give the museum some funds, but they're usually expected to pay back after a stipulated time frame. Like for example, they can give them one year, two years, five years, 10 years, depending on the amount that they're giving them. And every month they're supposed to pay some amount of money that they'll agree with the bank. Next is selling of artworks dif during different functions and the money is usually generated back to the museums. Now we have different artists and different 
creative work activities that usually take place in different museums. And a good example is at Nairobi National Museum, where we have different artwork from different people. Uh, when we have events at this Nairobi National Museum, this artwork is usually sold to different people who attend these events. As a result, the museum is usually able to get back some money and being able to sustain themselves. Now with the artwork, uh, once the piece of work has been sold by the museum, the, arts, the artist who came up with the artwork is usually given some percentage of the money and the museum retains some percentage. Uh, we have holding of events and functions at museums. Some fees is usually required to pay to be paid during these functions. And a good example where we have events taking place is the Nairobi National Museum and Fort Jesus in Mombasa. The more reason why people prefer Nairobi National Museum is because it's within the CBD, Central Business District. So accessing the facility is usually easy. And the main reason why people prefer Fort Jesus in Mombasa is because of the view and the ruins that are placed there. Thank you. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke. Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then, email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.